Good evening to you all, and thank you for coming. And today I'm going to talk about our Pliocene ancestors. And um, I will define what Pliocene is for the benefit of the doubt. But first, before I even talk about the ancestors, let's ask this question. How and where do we find the fossil remains of our ancestors? Because this is the key question. We got to find their remains first. And obviously, we don't find them in cemeteries. I wish we did, because unfortunately, those fossils of the early human ancestors are found in the hottest and remotest parts of the world, unfortunately. We have to go to these places to find these fossils. And when you look at the topography of these sites that we go to looking for our, the remains of our ancestors, as you can see, it's like an area with a temperature of about 110 to 120 degrees. But we love going there because that's where we find our, the remains of our earliest human ancestors. We look for fossils always with our eyes on the ground. Sometimes we don't find anything. Sometimes we find something. But most of the time, we find all these fossils on the surface. A lot of people think that when we go to the field looking for fossils, we excavate. But that's not what we do. Actually, we find most of the fossils on the surface, exposed by erosion, by wind, by trampling, and so forth. So here you see, uh, you see me um, holding just an isolated canine of an early human ancestor, which is about 3.6 million years old. Now, this canine is going to give us a lot of information about the canine morphology of the, these early human ancestors. But it was just on the surface. Sometimes we find things coming out of the ground. And this is when we excavate, literally. And uh, we excavate it, and that's not where it ends. We have to take all the specimens back to the laboratory. We have to clean them, prepare them, and then we start the analysis. It's only after that that we can start talking about these early human ancestors, who they were, how they lived, where they lived, and how old they are. And sometimes, if we're lucky, we even want to micro CT scan this fossil so that we can understand the internal structure of the bones of these early human ancestors and see if they have some similarity to, to our own bones. And then we can ask these questions. Now that we have all the fossils ready, we ask questions like, who are these ancestors? And where did they live in terms of geography and in terms of their habitat? In what kind of environment they were they living in? When did they live in, 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 in terms of time? And how related are they to us? Because when you look at the word ancestors, it means there are so many of them, right? And I will come back to that when I define Pliocene, but we're talking about millions of years. And throughout these years, many forms of ancestors have come and gone. Our task is to identify which ones of these ancestors are on the line that directly led to ourselves. And that's the big challenge for us as paleoanthropologists. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide my talk today to three parts. And the first part is going to be setting the stage in which I will define what the Pliocene epoch is in terms of how long it is in geological terms and what the paleogeography and looked like during the Pliocene compared to the earlier epochs that, were, that came before that and what the environment looked like. So this will give us the opportunity to understand in what kind of setting we find these early human ancestors during the Pliocene. Then the hominins. Hominins refers to our group, as, as I will define it later. But first, I want to talk about how do, you, how do we distinguish a species to be a hominin and not an ape or not a monkey or anything else? How, the, what are the defining criteria to, to diagnose a species as a, a member of the hominin group. And then we want to see how many species are we talking about during the Pliocene. And this is where the question of which one of them is our direct ancestor comes. So first, the Pliocene epoch. I, I want to give you some facts about the Pliocene. It's an epoch, a geological epoch. And it went from about 5.3 million years ago to about 2.6 million years ago. And this was about the time when there was global cooling and drying compared to the earlier Miocene, which goes from about 23 million years to about 5.3 million years. 
And there was also a spread of grasslands and savanna right at the beginning of the Pliocene. Now, geologists and paleoclimatologists have been trying to figure out why this transition from a much warmer period to a cooler and drier period came about to be. And there are some hypotheses in terms of the possible causes for this cooling and drying of uh, the Earth. And some of them, even though they're not certain, could be like changing the amount of heat transported by uh, the oceans, a higher concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and plate tectonics also had a lot of impact because it's about this time that we see some of these plates, particularly the Arabian plate, started moving to the north, clashing against the Asian plate, and that's when the Himalayas started forming. And you go to North America, most of the um, mountains we see in the Americas, like the, uh, the Cascades, the Rockies, Appalachians, and the Colorado Plateaus, were also starting to be uplifted. So there was a major tectonic activity at the end of the Miocene and beginning of the Pliocene. And again, these are some of the possible causes that people are forwarding in terms of why we have a cooler, the beginning of cooling and drying during the Pliocene, at which time we have a lot of uh, early human ancestors. So when you look at the world at the end of the Miocene, around 5.3, this is what it looked like. And what you see here is, in this area here, the Arabian plate is still connected to Africa. But it has already started drifting to the north. And look at the ice cap here. And when you compare it to today, look where the ice cap is. It's all covered, and this has already been drifted away, going to, 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 the, to the northeast. So there has been a lot of change. That's what I have to tell you about the paleogeography. Now, let's define what a hominin is. This is the group that we're going to talk about for, uh, for the rest of the time that I have. Now, the term hominin is like a short version of the tribe hominini. Tribe is below subfamily. Okay? So we call them hominine, and then hominini becomes a, a tribe after the subfamily tree. And this group includes us humans and all our extinct relatives subsequent to the split from the common ancestor we shared with chimpanzees. So all this taxa that came after the split from the common ancestor with chimpanzees would be in our group. But there are some traits that define them as hominins and not as apes. And this one of them is Bipedality. Now, you look at these animals, quadruped, walking on four. Uh, chimpanzees and gorillas are unique in their locomotor adaptation because they knock a walk. Monkeys are quadrupeds. It's only this animal that walks on this weird mode of locomotion, bipedality. So that's a defining trait of our, our group. The second defining trait <laughs> is lack of large horning canines. <laughs> You can see these animals, they have huge canines, right? But this one, I don't think you have big canines, Glenn, do you? So that's another character. These animals have big canines for, for specific purposes. But that purpose has been lost in our group. We, do, we didn't need long canines and scary you know, jaws like that anymore because we changed our lifestyles and uh, bonding styles and so forth. So, those two traits are usually used as the defining characters of any given species to be included into the group that we belong to. So by this definition, in the last six to seven million years of our evolution, we have identified at least 23 species of early human ancestors. Now, were all of them our ancestors? Maybe not. Some of them were probably cousins, but one of each at a given time must have been on the direct lineage that eventually gave rise to our species. And that's what we always try to find out. So with that introduction, I just want to show you the distribution here. Um, here we have some of the earliest human ancestors, potential ancestors. Uh, Sahelanthropus chadensis is the oldest, as, as we know it. It's about um, six to seven million years old. We have Aurorin togenensis from about six million years. 
This is from Kenya. This one is from Chad in Central Africa. We have Ardipithecus cadaba from about 5.8 to 5.2 million years from Ethiopia. That's the one that I named and um, published in 2001. And then as you go younger in time, about 4.4 million years ago, we have Ardipithecus ramidus. You've heard about RD, the partial skeleton that was published in Science in 2009. And this was one of the species that we saw some things that we never expected to see in our lineage, as I'll show you a little bit later. And then about 4.2 million years ago, we have a species known as Australopithecus anamensis. We have the fossil record for this species from about 4.2 to 3.9 million years ago. And then that's followed by Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis. This is the most documented and well-known species in our evolutionary history because we have hundreds of fossils, including partial skeletons and isolated jaws and maxillae, but we have a good understanding of this species more than any of this except for ourselves, of course. Then about this time period, this is what I'm going to concentrate on. There are some species named from different localities, but they lived about the same time as Lucy's species. One of them is known as Australopithecus Bahral Ghazali. This is from Chad, where Sahelanthropus chadensis was found. And this is probably about 3.4, 3.5 million years old. Another species named from Kenya, shown here, is Kenyanthropus platyops, also about 3.3 million years old. And it's n named as a new genus and species. Then once you pass the 3 million year time period, you start seeing all kinds of early human ancestors, including the South African forms like Australopithecus africanus, uh, we have Paranthropus ethiopicus in Eastern Africa. And then the Homo, which is our genus, starts appearing about 2.5 million years ago. Now, one of the questions that we have is, why does the genus Homo start at about 2.5 million years ago? And I think this is what Dr. Simpson is going to talk about uh, next week, so I'm not going to get into that. But we tend to have enormous diversity around 2.5 million years ago. So what triggered that diversity is one of the questions that we usually would like to, to answer. But then once we pass the two million years, we have Homo erectus, which is the ancestor of Homo sapiens. But also, you see some taxa identified during this time period, uh, some of them known as Homo heidelbergensis from about 800,000 years uh, to about 200,000 years. We have the Neanderthals, which a lot of people accept as a different species. And then this weird species that we found recently, the hobbit or Homo floresiensis from about 18,000 years ago, that's also an addition to the human uh, phylogenetic tree. And this is uh, what's known as um, Homo sapiens idaltu, about 160,000 years old human ancestor from Ethiopia. This is no different from anatomically modern Homo sapiens. So that's what we have so far. and this gives rise to anatomically modern Homo sapiens, who now live almost everywhere in the face of the Earth. On the family tree that you just set up there, what's the significance of the colors? I'm going to elaborate this a little bit later when I talk about uh, classification. But just to give, give you a quick answer, we divide those based on different classification methods. What you're seeing here is what we call grade-based difference. So what we have here is this blue ones are usually classified as one group as a grade. They have some characters that they share between themselves in terms of locomotor adaptation, in terms of diet, in terms of the habitats they live in. Those are the kinds of parameters that we see to group those into grade-based grouping. And then the green ones are all Australopithecus and Paranthropus. So this is what's called the Australopithecus adaptive plateau. They, were, they had big, can, big teeth. They have like humongous teeth. This is where what we call post-canine megadontia started, where they make their molars so big compared to the ones down here, which had relatively smaller molars. And then the last one is, of course, our genus, the genus Homo. So this, this is like a grade-based distinction. And I, we usually do this kind of coloration uh, to distinguish those adaptive plateaus at different times. 
uh, using this uh, family tree. Could you point out where uh, two things happened? Neanderthal came in and the earliest Asian uh, occurrence of the hominid family. Okay. Neanderthals generally appear about 300,000 years ago in the fossil record, as far as we know. It is, it is right, right here. So if you, if you look at the time scale here, Neanderthals show up about 300,000 years ago. But the first hu human ancestors made it to Asia long before that. The first species to leave Africa was Homo erectus, which is shown here by this long line here. And it starts about 2 million years ago. And we have the first evidence from the country Georgia from a place called Domenici. That's where we have the earliest record of Homo erectus to have left Africa about 2 million years ago. But they immediately dispersed to Southeast Asia. We have remains of Homo erectus from Indonesia. We have Homo erectus remains from China, even though slightly younger, about 500,000 years. So the first mig migration out of Africa happened about 2 million years ago. But Neanderthals don't appear in the fossil record until about 300,000 years ago. That's the earliest record that we have. You mentioned that the hominoids emerged during a cooling period. Uh, approximately, do you, is there any record that shows how that our global temperatures in those days versus today? Uh, this, this is based on a lot of evidence from like, you know, deep sea cores and, you know, the kind of, you know, temperature changes and, and so forth that geologists and, you know, paleoclimatologists paleoclimat have been working on. So there is a wealth of data to show that there was actually a cooling trend from the earlier Miocene to the Pliocene. So there, there is a good record uh, to indicate that there was a tendency uh, toward more cooler and drier time during the Pliocene compared to the Miocene. And compared to today? It's, it's, well, what we're seeing is it's, it's now it looks like we're getting warmer again. But to document the shift, we need a good chunk of time, like what we have for the Miocene Pliocene trans transition, because this is a record of like more than a million years to say that the general trend was toward cooling and drying. We can't really do it based on like, you know, data from a couple of years. We have to look the trend across a longer time period so that we can make a general statement like what we can do for the Miocene Pliocene transition. So right now, in our age, it looks like, you know, there's a serious global warming. But how far is it going to extend is something that we don't know. But what we can predict is the way it's going. If it continues going like this, obviously we're going to end up in serious global warming. And there will be a general trend from a cooler environment to a much warmer environment, like in who knows how many years. I seem to remember that there was every 12 to 15,000 years, there was an ice age. So isn't this contradicting or going in the opposite direction of global warming? Well, again, this is about time. We haven't, we haven't gone through like a thousand years yet. This is the Milan Milankovitch cycle, is that what it's called? So we, have, we, we still have time to see what the trend is going to be. And we, we're not into that stage yet because we can't make like general statements in terms of overall global warming based on our observations from 10 years or 15 years. We have to still follow this up because sometimes, like last year was probably cooler than this year, or this year was, we had more ice or more snow this year than last year. But it doesn't really tell us about the trend in terms of, you know, what is going to happen 100 years from now. Because in geological terms, we can't really talk about years. It has to be a longer time span. But those cycles have always been there, and we predict that they're going to always be there. So we'll wait and see if, if we live that long. Most of the evidence that we have for uh, the number of species at th two to three million years ago and the first emigration from Africa two to three million years ago is, uh, I think, based on the lack of the older fossils being found outside of Africa. But since the older fossils are so much scarcer than, than the uh, Homo erectus and uh, 
Australopithecus fossils. I'm wondering, uh, do we really know that there were fewer species or that they didn't leave Africa until then? Or is this only a reflection of the fact that the older fossils are so much more scarce that we don't have any evidence one way or another? We base our hypothesis and uh, form theories based on the, ev the fossil evidence that we have. Now, did we find any early human ancestor fossils outside the tropics or even Africa until later in time? No. But does that mean that they were not living outside Africa or outside the tropics? That remains to be seen by fossil discoveries from outside the tropics. If you follow the tropics, that's where most of these apes have been living in the Miocene, even before the Pliocene. You can follow that belt. The maximum diversification of apes, even during the Miocene, was within the tropics. And then they didn't leave until like 60 million years ago. They left Africa. They were very successful in leaving Africa and occupying most of Europe and some part of Asia. But humans, we don't have any evidence for that. We do have enough evidence for the apes, but not for the hominids, for, for the time after 7 million years. So that's why we're basing our evidence based on what, what we have in the fossil record. So part two, the Pliocene hominids. This is where I'm going to introduce you to the seven or eight hominin taxa that we have during the Pliocene. And then the third part would be trying to look at which one of this could be our ancestor, or which ones are valid species and which ones may not be valid species. So I'm going to start with Ardipithecus ramidus, which is about 4.4 million years old, which means in the Pliocene, that's the oldest that we have. Back in time, if you go to about 5.3, 5.4, of course, there is Ardipithecus cadaba and much earlier ones like Orientogenensis and uh, uh, Cylanthropus chadensis. But since I'm talking about the Pliocene, I'm going to start with Ardipithecus ramidus because it's 4.4. The next one is Australopithecus anamensis. We have some uh, few specimens that we understand this uh, species, and we, we know it's at least the ancestor of Australopithecus afrensis lucius species. And Australopithecus anamensis, as you will see in later slides, lived for about 300,000 years, as far as the fossil record we have is concerned. And Australopithecus afrensis follows after anamensis. And we have Australopithecus bahal Ghazali from Chad. This is the first early hominin that was to be found outside the East African Rift System. So there was, uh, it was very interesting in terms of the early Pliocene, middle Pliocene, early hominin uh, diversification and geographical spread in, in Africa. Australopithecus africanus is the first species of the genus, which was named in 1924 by a guy named Raymond Dart. The, name, uh, the genus name Australopithecus africanus was coined in 1924 with uh, a child cranium that I'll show you later, uh, naming that as a new uh, genus and species. We have something called Cananthropus palladiops. Not a whole lot of fossils are known from this species, and some people even doubt if it's a valid species. I'll talk about that too. And finally, we have Proanthropus ethiopicus. This is toward the end of the Pliocene. It's a, it, shows, it appears in the fossil record about 2.7, 2.6 million years ago, but it's still within the Pliocene time period. So that's why I, I included it. So I showed you the um, human family tree with all 23 or 22 species. But I'm going to talk about this part here, the Pliocene. And as you can see, there are at least seven taxa here that I listed on the previous slide. So when you look at the occurrence of this taxa, all of them come just from this part of the world. Most of them come from this part of the world, which is the East African Rift System. We have few taxa that are known from Southern Africa, mostly from cave sites. We have about three cave sites here that have yielded remains of Australopithecus africanus, starting about three million years to about two million years. That is to represent Chad for Australopithecus Bahal Ghazali, which is probably about 3.3 to 3.5 million years. But everything else comes from here, from the East African Rift System. So let's start with Ardipithecus ramidus. Ardipithecus ramidus has been documented from two sites. 
One is Aramis in the middle Awash. That's where it was named to begin with. But later works uh, produced remains of Ardipithecus Ramadus at Gona, which is not far from middle Awash. It's about 70 miles north of uh, the middle Awash. And the specimens in the middle Awash were dated, meaning uh, the geochronological age is between 439 and 44, which is very good, very good date. We're, we're talking about probably, according to the geologists who did the dating, we're talking about like give or take 50,000 years. And when you're talking about 4 million, 4, 5 million years, 50,000 years old margin of error is just nothing. So it, they tell you it can't get better than this, right? So this is also uh, radiometrically dated, and they, they have bracketed it between 4.3 and 4.5 million years. So what that means is that Ardipithecus ramidus lived in this part of the world somewhere between 4.3 and 4.5. And we have some specimens that are really notable, particularly the partial skeleton RD. This was found in 1994. As a matter of fact, I found the first piece, and we had to excavate it for like five years, oh no, sorry, three years to recover all the pieces that you see here. But it took 15 years to clean it, to analyze it, and eventually publish it. I was part of it, so I know how the fossils were preserved, and I know how much time it took to clean them and make them ready for publication. So some people thought 15 years was too much, but given the preservation of the specimen, 15 years was probably the fastest time that was, uh, it was done. So what we learned from this specimen is a lot. One, when you look at her feet, she had opposable toe. This is something that we never expected to see in any species in our lineage. She had long arms, as you can see, and long fingers. And based on the morphology that you see in this individual, you can make some inferences on the mode of locomotion, how the animal moved about when on the ground, and her ability to climb up trees. She was capable of climbing up trees, but she was not as, as good bipedal, as you can imagine, because it doesn't have the toe lined up with the other digits, which means it wasn't really towing off like we do, or even like Lucy's species, Australopithecus halfrensis. So it was more of a clamber, as the, the describers called it, than a, you know, a, an able walker when, when on the ground, but she had the ability to walk when on the ground and climb up trees. But there are also some traits in her pelvic area, the hip bones. They tell you a lot of story about how this area of our body actually evolved. What you see in this, largely cr crushed, but it was reconstructed using micro CD scan data, is that it has a mix of primitive ape-like traits and also human-like traits. The upper part of the pelvis is more like the letter humans, where the, the lower part is like apes. So the muscle attachment area for, you know, for the lower part of the pelvis was more like an ape, which explains her ability to climb up trees like other apes do. So it was a mosaic. And the mode of locomotion and her habitat, the inferred habitat, was really a surprise to most of paleoanthropologists because this was not what we expected to see from a 4.4 million old ancestor. Do any paleoanthropologists agree that this is on the human lineage? Some of them may not. Some of them think it's probably like on the ape lineage. But there are so many traits that exclude it from the ape lineage because when you look at the, the teeth, it has lost the canine honing complex. And detailed analysis shows that the, the, the foramen magnum, the big hole under our head, was positioned anteriorly like bipeds because apes do have their foramen magnum positioned way on the back because they're quadrupeds. So there are so many uh, features that link it to our lineage than to the ape lineage. So it was a very surprising discovery. But they have specimens from um, Gona, which also tell a lot of stories about uh, Ardipithecus cadaba. Uh, Ramidus, sorry, 
Then we come down to about 4.2, and we see a species known as Australopithecus anamensis. This is the potential ancestor of Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis. There is a lot of similarity between this group and Lucy species, Australopithecus anamensis. We see some primitive traits in this group, as you would expect. But most of the anatomy that you see in Australopithecus anamensis is very similar to that of Australopithecus afarensis, which is Lucy species. So this species was found from three different places. First, it was found in Kenya, a place called Kanapoi and Alia Bay. Kanapoi is slightly older um, than um, Alia Bay. Kanapoi is about 4.2 and Ali Bay is 3.9. So that gives you a good bracket for the age of uh, Australopithecus anamensis at, in Kenya. And then uh, they, they found some remains of the same species from a place called Asaisi in the middle Awash of Ethiopia. And this was compared to what they had uh, from Kenya, and they were good matches. And age-wise, this is somewhere between 4.1 and 4.2, so they had to put it all together into one species. The next species is Australopithecus afarensis. This is one of the most under well understood species that we have in our evolutionary history, because we have hundreds of fossil remains of this species from Ethiopia, from Kenya, no, some from Kenya, but Tanzania, Laetoli, where the holotype of the species is. And as you can see here, this is from Laetoli, dated to between 3.7 and 2.9, and most of them, the Laetoli forms are between 3.7 and 3.5, and the Harar forms are somewhere between 3.4 and 2.9 million years. So we have a time gap, a time frame of 2.9 to 3.7 for Australopithecus afarensis. We have a lot of notable specimens for this species, including Lucy, of course, and we recently found another partial skeleton from the site that I work at, Oranzo Mille, and we nicknamed it Kadanumu. And we have a, a child partial skeleton that there is an island that get found from a site known as Dikika. So now we can understand the growth and development of this species based on what we can learn from this child partial skeleton. We have adult female, we have adult male. We can understand the variation, sexual dimorphism in this species, and so forth. So we're getting a lot of information from this new discovery, such as Kadanumu. And what you see here is like there are elements that are not complete in Lucy, which are complete in Kadanumu. So now we can have a better understanding of what the thoracic cage looked like in this species. And we learn more as we move on finding more specimens. But what's really interesting about finding more fossils, especially partial skeletons, is that reconstructions, early reconstructions that were based on limited amount of fossils become corrected when you have more complete specimens. And that's exactly what we did with Lucy. This is the old reconstruction of Lucy. And you can see it's a weird kind of locomotor adaptation. You know, it's, it's all bent backwards. But with all the new evidence that we have, this is the new reconstruction we came up with. And this is on display at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, if you're interested to come and see. And we also looked at the face. And one of the most famous paleo artists had to do a flesh reconstruction of Lucy. And he came up with a very good reconstruction. And this is the new face of Lucy, which you can actually see at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, too. So we know a lot about Lucy's species than any, any other uh, taxon that I, I'm showing you here. This is Australopithecus Bahar Ghazali. This is one of the taxa that was found outside the East African Rift System. It was found in the 90, early 1990s. This is all they have. Maybe they now have another fragment of a jaw that they also assigned to the species. But it's known only from a single specimen. And morphologically, as I'll explain to you later, it looks a lot more like Australopithecus afarensis. So people argue that this could be part of Australopithecus afarensis. Here is another species, Kenyanthropus platyops, from Kenya, from about 3.3 to 3.5 million years, assigned to a new genus, a new species. I'm sure you don't like the preservation of this specimen, right? It's all cracked and distorted. But they named it a new genus and species anyways. And a lot of people, including myself, have issues with the naming of this. But it is there. 
And Prontropus ethiopicus, this is known from about 2.7 to 2.5. It's known from two areas in the Omo Basin in Ethiopia and West Turkana, Kenya. They're very close to each other, as you can see here. One is in Kenya and one is in Ethiopia. But it has a very tight time frame between 2.5 and 2.7. This is one of the groups that was really highly specialized. They had humongous teeth, and they, they show a lot of dietary specialization, which was different from the other taxa that we've already seen so far. So the, the Pliocene in general have this many specimens in Eastern Africa and North Africa. From South Africa, we have Australopithecus africanus from three cave sites, Stekfontein, Tong, and Makapansgat. And they're dated to between three and two million years. And Africanus is the first species to be, to be named for the genus Australopithecus. And this was named in 1924. We have some notable specimens. This is the holotype, a child cranium that was found in Taung. And this is what Raymond Dart assigned to a new species, Australopithecus africanus. A lot of people didn't agree with him until the 1950s uh, because of additional discoveries like this one, STS-5, uh, Ms. Plez, which is an adult individual, which was also found from Strickfontein. So Africanus has its own evolutionary history in South Africa. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, how do the South African forms relate to the East African forms? Can we establish like phylogenetic relationships between these groups, and how do they relate to our own genus, the genus Homo? I read that the movable larynx took around 100,000 years to develop. Did that happen in any of these species, or was it much later? I would say that we don't really know too much about soft tissue about of these early human ancestors. Um, one thing that we were able to say, at least some people were able to say, about evolution of you know language and you know uh, things related to that is presence or absence of the hyoid bone. Now the Dikika child has a hyoid bone, perfectly preserved. So the researchers have tried to talk about you know. Maybe there was some kind of rudimentary language in these groups. But everything else, soft tissue, none is preserved in, with any of these fossils. So we can't really talk too much about that other than the heart tissue, which is usually uh, the bone. So I don't think I can tell you a lot about what we know of the larynx you know, uh, shape or morphology of these early human ancestors. Going back to afarensis, you showed the male and female skeletons. Were those closely related in time, or are they, because the afarensis is a pretty long interval of time for that species, right? OK, I, I should have mentioned that. Um, Lucy is 3.2 million years old. And Kadanumu is 3.6 million years old. So there is, um, Kadanumu is older by about 400,000 years, but it's still within the time frame of Australopithecus afarensis. Um, unfortunately, we, we didn't recover the head whatever happened to the head. But most of the taxonomic identifications are based on teeth and cranial morphology. We could not identify it as a species distinct from Australopithecus afarensis because in terms of its postcrania, it's indistinguishable from what we know of Australopithecus afarensis. So that's why we had to put it up into Australopithecus afarensis because that was the only available species that we have from that time period. Because we, at that time, we know that there is Australopithecus Bahar Ghazali from Chad and Kenanthropus platyops from Kenya. But those taxa don't have any postcranial element. So we can't really compare them to, to see if they actually belong to those other species other than Australopithecus afarensis. But yeah, in terms of age, geological age, they, they differ in about 400,000 years. Did any of these species or all of them use tools? And do the tools help you define whether they are in our line of uh, descendancy or not? Uh, I'm sure Dr. Simpson is going to talk about this next week. But what I can tell you for now is that tool use or tool making, I would say, maybe not tool use, tool making didn't start, as, at least as far as the evidence is concerned, until after 2.5, the earliest 2.6. And that coincides with the beginning of our genus, Homo. So people have tried to relate the beginning of tool making with the origin of the genus Homo and make a lot of, you know, what dietary shifts 
followed, like you know, adding meat to, the, to their diet and expansion of the brain and so forth. But I, I think this will be something that Dr. Simpson is going to talk about next week. But none of these earlier forms show any evidence for tool making. We don't have any evidence yet. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't use tools. Because we know chimpanzees use tools, monkeys use tools, right? But making, tool making is slightly different from tool using. So, Going back to Artie, uh, it's a mosaic of human-like and ape-like features. Would you say that it's a, either the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds? A, a good climber and a good walker or a lousy climber and a lousy walker? The latter. But. I think the latter, yeah. Lucy, Lucy probably walked on two feet better, much, much better than Artipithecus. And um, the only thing is, maybe Artipithecus had all the primitive traits retained, but that's what you don't see in species like Australopithecus afarensis. So did, could Artie walk for like long distance? No, maybe not. But it was just, you know, based on its, you know, where its habitat, where it's living, it didn't probably require to travel longer distance. It was just living in this more wooded habitat where there was a lot of resource for it to exploit. But I'll get to that paleoecological reconstruction a little bit later in my part three. But with the changing climate, it would have some advantages uh, that would help with its survival rate? Yeah, well, with the change, change of climate, when we say there was a trend toward cooling and drying, it doesn't necessarily mean that there were no more forests or you know, woodland. There was still some, but the general trend was toward cooling and drying. That's where you see the expansion of savanna grasslands like in, in Eastern Africa. But it doesn't mean that all the other kinds of habitats were gone. They were still there to some degree, but the percentage of those habitats is what probably changed because of the cooling and drying. I was surprised to see that an entire species was uh, created for a small jaw fragment missing a lot of its lower incisor teeth. Uh, how could we be sure it's even in the right place? For example, we don't know if it had the large fangs, the position of the form and magnum, whether or not it was a quadruped. Isn't there a minimum amount of material you have to have before you can make these determinations? Are you talking about the specific? Yes, yes. Species, which, which one are you talking about? Uh, the one, I think he was from Chad, just a... Uh, the uh, Chadian one, the, yeah. just the jaw? Just the jaw, okay. right. Is that, is that, that's really not enough information for a whole that, species. That's a problem, and that's why people think it's probably just, you know, another form or a geographic variant of Australopithecus afarensis because time was just at the same time. But you can't really say much because the characters that they came up with all relate to the shape of the symphysis, okay? How it's vertical versus inclined in Australopithecus afarensis. How the premolar had three roots instead of two. Those are like characters that they never thought people were going to see in Australopithecus afarensis. But what we now know is that those traits that they used to distinguish Bahar al-Ghazali from afarensis are actually in afarensis. Hmm. We have specimens with those traits that were used as distinguishing traits of Australopithecus Bahar al-Ghazali. So that's why some people argue that Bahar al-Ghazali is just a geographic variant of Australopithecus afarensis. So its validity is in question. But I'll, I'll talk about that a little later when I talk about the phylogenetic relationships. So now let's go to part three. Here I'm going to talk about a little bit about paleohabitat, because this is a very important subject, particularly when we talk about evolution or our own evolution, because environment plays a major role in how species are formed, how they go extinct or species. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, the second part is going to be phylogenetic relationship. This is where we're going to talk about which species are valid, which species may not be valid, and look at the relationships between uh, those groups. But first, I'll talk a little bit about how we reconstruct paleohabitat in the past. Now, people use various methodologies to reconstruct past habitats. One of them is trying to look at modern analogs. In this method, there is a major assumption. And the assumption is the animals that we see today, compared to the animals who lived in the past, if they're related, the animals who lived in the past must have been living and doing the same thing as their modern relatives. That's an assumption. It may not always be true. 
But when you do modern analog analysis, that's the big assumption. Extinct relatives were doing the same thing as their living relatives. But it has gone beyond that, and people have now started looking at isotopes from teeth, from soil. They look at the chemical you know, composition of teeth and um, uh, soils and look at the carbon amount in soils and enamels. And they can tell you whether an animal, by looking at enamel uh, isotope, they can tell you whether an animal was eating more C3 plants or C4 plants, meaning more leaves and fruits versus grass. Because the signal that you get from these teeth is real. It, it's a reflection of what these animals were eating. Okay. And some people do what's called ecomorphology. They try to study the lo lower extremity bones and try to reconstruct how an animal might have moved around when, when it lived. So they combine all this data into a big data set to infer paleo habitats in the past. So let me start with the first one, like modern analogs. <coughs> habitats are divided into various segments based on the kind of vegetation that you see in them. Now, we call something forest if it's multi-tiered, thick canopy of trees that are greater than 18 meters high. So we ha you have multiple canopies. This is forest. You go further, you get like thicket and scrub, not, not a whole lot of tree, but still have trees and shrubs without stratification like what you see here. And then you come to the savanna ecosystem, which is divided into various segments. We have savanna that, that, have, that have some trees, and it gets less trees and eventually you get to the desert, which is no vegetation or little grass. So these are like the habitats that are divided based on vegetation. And when you look at the modern animals, what you will see is there are animals who live specifically in the forest environment. There are other animals who live in wooded, closed woodland or open woodland or savanna in, in grassland areas. So what we do is, we look at these extinct forms and see how related they are to these living forms. If, for example, Paracolobus is found in, it's an extinct form, if you find it in, in your hypodime or in your faunal assemblage, you can say, well, maybe there were trees here to support that kind of colobin uh, uh, assemblage. You can talk about kudus. Kudus today live in more wooded, wetland kind of environment. And their ancestors, you would assume, were probably living in the same kind of environment. You look at wildebeest. Today we know that they're like grassland animals. If we find what could potentially be ancestors of wildebeest in the Pliocene, the assumption would be that they were doing the same thing as their modern relatives. So this is how you do modern analog analysis. And when we collect fossils in the field, even, we, even if we're like human paleontologists, it doesn't necessarily mean that we collect only the human remains. We collect everything that we can identify. Because it's the animal fossil remains that give us the contextual information to what we're trying to do, to reconstruct the paleo environment in which our earliest human ancestor lived. We need those fossils. We need to understand their evolutionary history. We need to understand what kind of environment they lived in. Because humans in those days, like today, they were not living alone. They were living with the rest of the animals and plants that were around at that time. And the second um, method that people have been using uh, more recently is isotope analysis. Now here they can sample enamel from fossil teeth and look at the carbon composition and measure it per mil. And what you see here in this graph is that these are all you know, some of the taxa, some of which uh, I talked about. They try to look at the amount of carbon uh, D13, uh, the delta C13 in each of these samples. What they found out is like species like Australopithecus anamensis and Australopithecus ramidus had very depleted carbon signal compared to a lot of the species that you see here that have a wide range of carbon. And then you come up here, this is carbon rich, which tells you that this is more C3 plants, meaning fruits and leaves. Whereas here, it's totally grass-dominated diet that you're seeing. So 
what you see here is like three distinct categories in terms of their diet. One that is mostly C3 dominated, and the other one is mixed, and another one entirely C4. These are the specialized ones that I talked about, like humongous teeth. They were just like grinding machines. And all the signal we get from them is C4. They were like grass uh, based on you know, uh, C4 resources in, the, in their diet. So we also look at isotope uh, analysis to infer um, habitats and dietary um, adaptations. So when you look at this, most of these taxa are doing a lot of things. They're eating C3 plants and C4 plants. And you, know, you can't really draw any line here to distinguish you know, C3 versus C4. So that's why they're like mixed feeders. They're eating, they're you know, um, exploiting both C3 and C4 plants. So with all that data, what was Pliocene hominid habitat like? In one word, mosaic. It was like a mix of stuff. There were C3 resources, there were C4 resources, but it doesn't necessarily mean that some of these taxa actually preferred one thing against another. Just to give you an example, Ardipithecus ramidus. Most of the data that we have from Aramis indicates that Ardipithecus ramidus at Aramis preferred more closed woodland habitat. But Ardipithecus ramidus was also found from another site, Gona. And one of the discoveries, by the way, here, Dr. Simpson. And you can ask him about the paleo habitat they sampled at Ardipithecus ramidus site in Gona. It was more open. So you can't really generalize that this species was actually adapted to closed woodland habitat, because you're sampling different things at two different places. What that tells you is that they had preferences. The resources that were available for them could be both C3 and C4 but they could preferably consume C4 resources instead of C4, you know, C3 resources instead of C4, right? Same thing with Australopithecus anamensis. People thought that, well, once, you know, the teeth got larger with the beginning of Australopithecus, which is Australopithecus anamensis, they were probably eating more C4 diet. But what we now know from all the carbon isotope signals is that Australopithecus anamensis, even though it had a lot of C4 resources, it preferred C3 resources. So there is a preference that you see here. But when you look at the other taxa, they were eating all kinds of stuff. So they were sort of opportunistic. They were just you know, consuming anything that they could get their hands on. So in general, when you combine all this data, you can infer that all the habitats of this Pliocene hominins range from closed woodland, as we've seen it in uh, Aramis and other sites in uh, Kanapoi, to bushland, open woodland, shrubland, and grassland. This is like a vast array of habitats that you sample for this uh, early uh, Pliocene, um, um, Pliocene hominins. So that's what I have to say about the um, paleohabitat reconstruction. Now let's go to the last part of uh, this talk, which is phylogenetic relationships. Now we're going to talk about a few of them, like the ones that we discussed, the seven taxa that we have from the Pliocene. But in order to understand their phylogenetic relationships, we have to have a concept of how we divide these animals. How do we classify them? What are the criteria in, in terms of classification? And there are a few ways of classifying or looking at relationships. One is what we call clade-based classification. This classification literally looks at the process of evolutionary history. It's not going to tell you who is the ancestor of who? But it can tell you who is more related to who. But no ancestor descendant relationship from this kind of classification. Nor does it tell you which species lived at what time. So it's like X and Y are more related to Z. Z is like farther from these two. That's all you can get from uh, clade based classification. The second one is grade based classification, which is based on the outcome of evolutionary history. This is when you, where you look at how they were moving, their locomotor adaptation, what they were eating. Those are the kinds of things that you see in uh, grade-based classification. And I'll show you an example, examples from both. This is a cladogram. 
this is the classification you come up with, clade-based classification. And everything that you see here tells you that Sahelanthropus is related to everything at this node. We call this node. So this would be one clade, one huge clade. Every time you move on, that node there will form another clade to the exclusion of Sahelanthropus. You keep on going, and you reach here. You can clearly see that the Homo species form one clade of their own. It tells you how related they are and how far distant they are with each other, but it doesn't really tell you who the ancestor is. And this is only good to look at you know, relationships based on uh, morphology. But when you look at the grade-based classification, this was supposed to be colored, but uh, it's black and white, but you can still see the difference here. You have one here that is identified as possible primitive hominids. This includes the earliest forms like Sahelanthropus chadensis, uh, Orontogenensis, Ardipithecus cadaba, and even Ardipithecus ramidus is included in this uh, group, which is called the Ardipithecus adaptive plateau. And then you have this group of Australopithecus taxa, which some people refer to as archaic hominins. And then you go like the megadont archaic hominins. This is the robust lineage, Paranthropus. And eventually you have the pre-modern Homo and Homo sapiens by itself. So this is based on, as I said, locomotor adaptation and uh, the diet they consume and so forth. But still, you can't really tell much about who is the ancestor of who in this regard. So you look at the combined data set and try to understand who gave rise to who. And here, we, here is where the trap is. You look at this area here, you have three contemporaneous taxa, right? Australopithecus Bar Ghazali, Kenyanthropus Palladiops, and Australopithecus Alfrancis Lucius species. So which one of this is the ancestor that eventually gave rise to what came later, or at least the genus Homo? OK, here is what we're going to do. Now, we have Ardipithecus ramidus, we have Australopithecus anamensis, we have Lucius species Australopithecus Alfrancis, Kenyanthropus Palladiops, and we have Australopithecus Bar Ghazali. These are about the same time. They come from about between 3.5 and 3 million years. Which one of this is the ancestor that gave rise to our lineage? Let's say we give them faces. Here is Ardi. Here is Australopithecus anamensis. This would be Kenanthropus platyops. This is Lucy species Australopithecus afrensis. And this would be Bahal Ghazali, only if this are all different species. This is what one group of paleoanthropologists thinks. Another group, however, thinks that what we have at these three places is the same John Doe. <laughs> the only difference, they explain, is because John Doe number one is wearing glasses, whereas John Doe number two is wearing a hat. That's the difference. Otherwise, this is all John Doe number one. And I incline to this one. I think, unless proved wrong by finding more fossils from this site and this site to show us that it's actually different from Australopithecus afrensis, I'm not convinced that these two actually represent a different species from Australopithecus afrensis. Then, what does that leave us with? Lucy species, Australopithecus afrensis. So does that mean Lucy species really was it really alone during the middle Pliocene? If it was, then it would be the perfect candidate to be the ancestor. But I guess the answer is no. Because recent work at my site at Warren Zumile have produced a partial foot, the Burtelle partial foot, which clearly shows it was not as bipedal walker as Australopithecus afrensis. This definitely belongs to a, a species different from Australopithecus afrensis. So this is the first evidence to show that there was more than one species during the Middle Pliocene. Nobody could argue with this one as much as they can argue with Bahar Ghazali and Kenyanthropus palladiops. So you would ask, you know, are there any Pliocene hominids yet to be found if we're finding, like, you know, the Portelli partial foot? Could there be more hominids to find from the Pliocene? 
And I can tell you that the answer is more than likely. Because those, if there are any new species, they're not going to be found at Hara, where they've been working for the last 30 years. They're not going to be found at Laitoli either, where they've been working for the last 30, 40 years. They're going to be found in new sites, like the one that I'm working at, the Woronzo Mille. We already have a lot of fossils from this site that we're still working on to actually figure out what species they belong to. And obviously, as, as we finish the analysis, you'll be the first to know about it. <laughs> Thank you very much.